yes, um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening for the third webinar in the series for the Armagh Banbridge Craig Avon Council Food for Thought project. Um, we're here this evening with the really brilliant Kieran McHugh from the Conservation Volunteers, who's going to give us a wee presentation on um, making compost. Um, natural pest control and a bit about identifying weeds and stuff uh, and then we'll we'll have a lively question and answer session after that hopefully um, this is being recorded so um, you can keep your camera on or your camera off um, and feel free to put in the chat box any questions that you have and we'll um, We'll get through them at the end. So, Karen, do you maybe want to start with? You've got a wee pres presentation. Yeah, I'll just see if I can share it. Can everybody see that? You're not sharing. Not sharing. Oh, not, yeah, not not yet. That's you. That's great. You can. Oh, hey, welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> uh, well, like Jilly says, um, tonight we're going to be looking at composting and hopefully we'll touch on um, weed control and pest control as well. So um, we'll start with composting, if that's OK. Um, so we're looking at making your own compost and then natural pest control and weed control. Um, many things uh, can be composted. We try not to use cooked meat or any meat really, or cooked food. The reason is it, it, it can attract vermin as well. And you don't want to be getting rats and mice into your garden really. Um, you've got to remember that worms are our friend. Um, you know they they go into your compost heap they help with aeration they help with drainage and they move the nutrients around the soil as well so worms are our friend um, it's recommended to wear gloves and wash your hands thoroughly after handling compost because it is a soil-based product and you know there is there's lots of microorganisms in there that can get into any tiny cuts or anything into your hands really so it's always best to have good hygiene really and washing your hands. It, it's easy to make your own compost in your garden. A lot of people are shy away from it. They think it's complicated, but it isn't complicated at all really. Um, uh, you, you can make your own compost bin or you could, you know, you could make, I'd make mine out of old pallets or any scrap wood that's around really, but you can buy, you can buy these plastic ones or you can get barreled ones. They all do the same job, but I like to save money. And I also think to myself, if I'm using old wood or old pallets, that's less that's going into the landfill sites. So I try to encourage people to reuse materials. Or if you haven't got any wood or plastic, you can always just have a heap of compost on you on your bed somewhere or in a corner of your garden that you don't use in a sheltered spot, just have a heap. Just remember to turn it regularly. That's the only, the only thing you have to do. Um, like I've put here, um, making your own compost or using a peat-free compost that you could buy, um, it saves on natural resources, particularly peatlands or boglands, which are important habitats to invertebrates, insects, even mammals really, little little voles, um, lots of animals, are, it's their habitats. And it's also um, helps with the biodiversity. Also your peat bogs also capture the carbon from the atmosphere and trap it in the soil. So that's another reason why we want to keep our, um, our wetlands and boglands really. 
it's all it's also more environmentally friendly way of getting rid of your kitchen waste you know or your garden waste you know instead of sending it to landfill sites compost it uh, it's better for you better for the environment you can add lots of things to your compost that otherwise you know would have gone to the recycling you know a lot of people forget that you can use paper um, shredded paper cardboard as well as your kitchen waste so it also saves you money as well if you're going to make your own compost and it helps you actually know that you're getting the goodness to put back into your soil when you've made your own compost you don't have to just use it for um the vegetables like i've put here if you like to grow bedding plants or flowers you can use your your homemade compost for that too right um question people normally ask is it hard to do well obviously um i'm going to say no but um here's some that we've done earlier as you can see these are free three bays it can take up to about six months to a year to make make a good compost but it all depends on the weather you know if it's and where you've situated the um the compost bin as well would have a big factor the the most important thing is to to turn it regularly i try and turn mine at least every two weeks that way it it mixes it well and it uh, gets the oxygen back into the um the bed um, yeah i've put here um, some factors that influence how long it's going to take how wet it is whether or not the worms can get in you know if you've got something on the bottom and the worms can't actually work their way up through the compost then that's going to affect the breaking down um, process I like to layer up lots of materials over time and like I say, turning it, let the air in. It, it's a good idea to have more than one, you know, three is a, an ideal situation because while you're working one compost bin, you've got one that's already composted. So you can actually use that one and then you've got two to, to work on. I hope I'm not going too fast, but, um, we will have uh, some questions at the end. Um, a lot of people, like I said, think it's complicated. I think it's quite simple if you use this sort of uh, ratio. So you're talking of two parts of brown material, which is on the left hand, sorry, on the right hand side of this, this um, chart here. The, the brown parts is what we call um, cardboard shredded down, something that isn't living. Um, whereas the green would be something that was living, which is grass clippings, apple cores, banana skins, coffee grounds, tea bags, fresh hedge clippings. I, I tried to not have it too woody if I can help it, but if, if you can't help it, chop it down as fine as you can. You know, you want to help the worms and the, the other microorganisms to work, you know, make it easy for them and they'll help you. So if you chop it down as fine as you can, um vegetable peelings old flowers you can add weeds but don't have the seed heads in there or the weeds roots at all because all you're going to do then is encourage weeds into your your compost heap so then we're looking at brown like i said cardboard torn up into small pieces um shredded paper newspaper um i shred the newspaper as well um sawdust wood shavings Fallen leaves is great. Straw, you know, this is all what we class as brown. And what I would do is um, I would always mix two parts of the brown to one part of green. What, what's happening with the brown is that adds carbon to your, um, your compost, whereas the green will add nitrogen. Um, if, if you're finding that your compost heap is smelling, that's a clear indication that you've probably got too much nitrogen, too much green. So you can always add some more brown. You'll find your own balance. But if you keep to that ratio of two buckets or two bags of green, uh, sorry, of brown to one bag of uh, green, I hope that makes sense. But we can always uh, come back to it later if you want to. Another thing I've, I've made here, I like to um, 
I like to sieve my compost once it's made. And then the, the big, bigger lumps or the twiggy bits, I'll just put them into the next bay to break down even further. There's, there's no actual rush to um, making your compost. You know, if it takes six, six months or 12 months, it doesn't matter as long as you're getting that good, good ratio and you're getting some good nutrient rich compost at the end of the, the uh, process. Um, like I say, I like to sieve it. Um, as you can see here, it's just a little mesh that you can buy from um, DIY shops, or you might find it laying around somewhere and then some scrap wood. It always makes it easier for, for doing it. Right, getting the balance right. Last, this, I've just touched on this earlier. Um, if it's too wet and smells, add more brown, which is the carbon, which is your, your shredded newspaper, your cardboard, your brown leaves that you've raked up in the autumn time. Um, if it's too dry, you can always add more green material that will wet it and rot down. Or if it's not, not possible, just give it a soaking. Not too much, you know, it, it wants to be damp, but not sodden that it's going to be leaching all the nutrients out of it on you. Remember to turn it regularly to add oxygen and it also helps to break it down. Um, remember to add material in small pieces. Another thing is don't add too much at once if you can, you know, you don't want the worms having to work overtime. You want them to give them just enough so that they can break it down. If you give them too much, then a lot of it won't get broken down. Um, right, so um, do you want to ask any questions on composting or shall we just move on to natural pest control? Is there any questions on composting or shall I just move on? Yeah, has anybody got um, any questions yet or? I just put my glasses on. I was pretty broke dark here in myself now, I have to say. Um, Can I ask one? Sure, of course. So um, I was just wondering about, um, what about if you've got any other things around your house, like if you've got chickens or horses or any sort of of their kind of manure, Can you is that good to put in or does that mess about with your mix? No, add it, add it if you like. That will help because that will also work the worms and they'll they'll like to break that down as well. Yeah, 100%. Patricia, um, do you said if you chickens or what was the other thing? Horse of horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, as Karen said, um, chicken manure, even like rabbit bedding and, and horse manure and all of that would just, yeah. I suppose anything except dogs or cats really. Yes, yeah, you, you want to avoid that if possible. Yeah, great, good question. Also, well, I am um, something I get asked a lot, Kieran, is um, people get worried about making a compost bin um, and about the furry friends. I think you touched on them there, like the, the mice or, or, or the bigger ones, even. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but if you Actually, the way to, if you turn your compost quite often, um, they haven't time to get comfy. Sure, they don't, you know. No. So, and, and obviously, don't put in cooked food or meat or, or anything like that. If you are finding that they are, they are getting in, put some chicken wire or meshing around your compost heap. That will deter them somewhat. Um, another thing I should have touched on is... When, when you're looking to see if your compost is ready, if it's still very warm in the middle, which is which does attract vermin as well because they like the heat, then it's not quite ready. Keep turning it, you know, it's still working. That's that's another indication that, that it's working if you if you can still feel warmth in it, it's still breaking down. Excellent, good tip. Um Karen, we do actually we have uh, Tracy is asking the questions here about slugs just as we're moving on to natural pest control and um, she wants to know how does she keep them away from her herbs and that they love her lemon balm in particular. Well, if, if you have a look at the bottom picture, 
we have there a little cut off piece of a, a plastic bottle that will help somewhat um, instead of throwing your your eggs into your compost crush them up and put them around or you know sharp sharp sand as well they, they don't like going over the, the sharp edges on sharp sand or eggshells but um the, the best method is to either go out at night with a torch and look for them um if you've got any plant pots nearby, they'll be on hiding underneath that. If you have bark underneath, they'll hide under the bark. They hide at, during the day and then they tend to come out at night and devour everything. But it's a good thing is to keep looking. Um, I think it was Patricia there mentioned that chicken, if you've got chickens, let the chickens eat them. You know, they'll find them and scratch them up. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Chickens are a good, um, good. Also, frogs. You know, if you can carry, have a small pond, even a dish of water, sort of um, like washing up bowl that's sunk into the ground, um, it, it'll attract um, frogs and other wildlife like hedgehogs and stuff, which which eat slugs. So, um, but I am. Um, I think coffee grounds and and eggshells and stuff are really good as well. Um, and the slug watch, um, I do, Simon, my husband, he would go out at night time with a torch, slug hunting. Uh, I think he's quite proud of it, actually, he'll come in and say there were 229 tonight. So, <laughs> um, and we usually do that kind of in, coming up now in the next few weeks to try and get on top of them before they start breeding and stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, going out with a torch and picking them off is really, really, really does help. Actually, so um, also we've got we've got a message here from Joan saying, um, do, do bird feeders in your garden attract mice? And if yes, how do you keep the mice away? Um, what do you think about that, Karen? They, they do. But the thing is, um, with bird feeders, what a lot of people forget or tend to forget is you're supposed to clean them regularly because, you know, you, even when you're topping up the feeders, at least once a week or every two weeks, you're supposed to clean them and then clear up any of the debris from underneath, you know, because the birds will drop it onto the floor and it's that that attracts the, the vermin. But if you keep it clean, um, you tend to not get them too much. Um, another thing that um, I, I should have mentioned with the slugs there, when you do go out at night time with your torch, don't be tempted to throw them to another part of your garden, put them on your bird feeder. You know, some of them will still be there in the morning when the, the dawn chorus arrive and they'll, they'll love the slugs that you don't want. So uh, having bird feeders in your garden as well is a, is a great way of attracting birds into your garden that will get rid of your slugs and many of the other um, flying pests or crawling pests that we don't want. Great, thank you, Karen. So we'll, be go we'll go on with the, um, there will probably be lots more hints and tips in the natural pest control section. Uh, yeah, well, like I've just said there, if you can, can encourage predators into your garden, like birds, um, like Jilly said, if you have a pond that will attract toads and frogs um, into your garden, uh, having chickens, that's a great way of getting rid of a lot of pests. But you just got to be mindful that chickens will eat your produce as well. Any young leaves, they, they'll eat them too. Um, plant partnering is another great way. What we mean by plant partnering is if you have a look in the middle picture there, we've got the onions next to the cabbages. That, um, the smell of the onions disguises the smell of the carrots. So the likes of your, your carrot fly, he, he can't smell them. The, the carrots because all he can smell is the, the onions. Um, another tip that I was once told years ago, when you're thinning your carrots out, always do it on a, a wet day because that also stops the smell of the, the onions because once you start pricking out, they, the uh, carrot fly can then smell the carrots from miles away and come flying in or crawling into your garden. Um, another tip is, um, I think Jilly mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, to plant them in pots, plant your pots, carrots in pots, 
because the carrot fly can't jump up or even raised beds. If you have them in raised beds, that's going to stop them from jumping up onto your carrots. So that's what we mean by plant partnering. Another thing is like marigolds, the smell of marigolds in your cabbage. The cabbage fly doesn't like the smell of marigolds. There's, there's lots of different, um, different things you can do, but if you can disguise your valuable crop in amongst others, that's another reason why we have lots of different things growing in, in the raised beds or in your borders, so that it disguises the smell and it confuses the, a lot of the um, insects or predators. Uh, you can use natural repellents, like um, I use a garlic and chili powder spray. Uh, also add mint to it as well, and that can help. I ha I'm a big fan of using nettle soup to feed my, um, my vegetables. And I was once told that even using that deters some of the the um the predator the, not predators but the the pests that come into your garden they don't like the smell of your uh, I don't like the smell of my nettle soup but uh, that's another you another way of doing it um I've put down here using barriers such as netting um as you can see the the bottle top there at the bottom picture on the right you know it it just stops a lot of them from getting to the the leaves the young leaves um, like I mentioned with the carrots, if you sow them in pots about six inches off the ground, then the likes of your, your cabbage fly, he can't get into your, um, your carrots. Brilliant. Karen. and just um, what, what's your recipe for the garlic, mint and chilli um, powder spray? What would I you just, um, we, we crushed the garlic down. Do you know, if we're cooking with garlic and you've got an extra clove, left over, just crush it down and, you know, grind it all up. And it's the oil from the garlic. We mix that with some chili powder and mix it in with water and just give it a good shake. We have it in a bottle, one of these um, spray bottles and I just go out every now and again. I don't do it regularly. It's just every now and again. And I just spray it with it. Okay, lovely, thank you. But you can add mint as well. You know, you can get peppermint oil. Just pop a bit of that in as well from the, your your leaves. If I use a, a, is it a mortis, I forget pe pestle and mortis, it's called, and I do everything in that and then add it to the bottle. Oh, um, very nice. So you don't you don't have to boil it up or anything. You just a lot of people do, but I I'm lazy, <laughs> so I don't. But it seems to work whatever I'm doing. Okay. But, Um, like I've got here, lift up enough, look underneath the leaves. As you can see there, there's some green fly under there, but I, you can rub them off with your finger. You know, don't be too rough that you're going to damage the leaf, but just rub them off, get rid of them. That way um, you could spray it with the, the same chili and garlic powder um, spray that I've got because it's a, an irritant to them. But a solution of, you know, washing up liquid, um, if you can get a nice mild washing up liquid and spray that on, they, that's an irritant to them as well. But dilute it. Um, it really wants to be diluted. Don't put it on because you don't want to burn your leaves, really. Um, we used to, our old washing bowl, you know, we use a bowl rather than letting all the water get down the sink because we like to conserve water. So the old washing bowl that we have, let that dry, uh, dry, cool down, and throw that on at night time. Um, like as we said earlier, look underneath your pots. You, you do get slugs hiding underneath the pots. I don't know why I'm showing you here. I haven't got a pot, but, but I, I lift the pot up. I had a, I think I may have told you last week, a friend of mine, he used his recycled pots, but he had them outside and, he sowed his, repotted his tomato plants and he came back the next day and there was a slug underneath the pot and he, he lost his tomato plants. But that was just poor hygiene, really. He should have washed his pot, his recycled pot. So, yeah, look underneath your pots. Check for pests like slugs at night using the torch. We touched on that. Um, pick off any pests. So if you see a slug on your, 
on your produce, pick it off, add it to the bird table, like we said earlier. But Karen, we have um, we have a question here from Lucy and then also Patricia to say any suggestions for keeping white fly away from cauliflowers. Um, also, uh, Lucy had a lot of green caterpillars last year, even with the netting. And Patricia is asking about green fly. So I suppose green fly and white fly are quite similar, aren't they? Yeah. Again, um, the tajiti, the marigolds, they, they don't like the smell of marigolds. So if you could interplant some marigolds in amongst your cabbage, that, that's been going on since Roman times, really, that they used to plant marigolds with their cabbages to to stop the it's the smell you see they don't they don't like the smell of the marigolds and your tajatees you get little little flowering tajatees they just don't like the smell of them that's um and netting is is probably the the next best thing yeah. for your for your green fly and white fly too karen you could probably use your your spray yes um i would say yeah definitely um but I know what you mean about the net and they seem to have, they seem to be Houdini, don't they? They seem mm -hmm. to, caterpillars do seem to get in, but it is, it's kind of being vigilant and just watching. Um, and when you see something, pick it off, as you say, and, and feed it to, don't be throwing it into the neighbor's garden, but f or maybe feed it to the birds or something. But check the ground as well, because they do fall off and, you know, they're, they're on the floor as well as underneath the leaves. You, you've, you've really got to like, Jilly says, be vigilant. They'll they'll find anywhere. So check underneath the leaves, on the floor. It's like it's like a whole search, searching the plant, like you're at the airport. <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. So then, moving on from from past the weeds. Right. Um, the, the definition of a weed is a plant that you don't want. I mean, if if you had a nice rose garden and you had a rhododendron weed growing in the middle of it that would be a weed so um they're not necessarily bad bad plants like i mentioned nettles earlier um i love nettles because i i just chop them up and make my nettle soup out of it i think i mentioned the nettle soup last week if you fill a bucket full of chopped up nettles and then fill it full of water and leave it for about um six weeks in the far end of your garden away from the house because it does smell bad and then mix that with 10 parts of water so you'd you'd sieve it and use one part of the nettle tea in your watering can or your watering bottle to 10 parts of water and it's the greatest feed out there really and like we said earlier um some some pests don't like the smell of it so that helps so yeah not all weeds are bad some of, some of the weeds could also host nettles again. You know, they could host your green fly, which then attracts predators into the garden that like to eat your green fly, like your ladybirds, your lace wings, even wasps. You know, they'll eat your green fly and your white fly. So, you know, if you can have uh, sacrificial plants like weeds in a part of your garden or a part of your bed, that you know, that would also help with your pest control. So, like I said here, if something's growing that you don't want, then technically that's a weed. Um, if you had a lavender seed that blew into your um, your vegetables patch and then germinated, you've got a lavender plant growing where you don't want it. So that lavender would then be a weed. Um, common weeds there are, as you see in the top picture, dandelions, nettles, creeping buttercup, chickweed, this, it's endless really there's so many different ones that we could talk about um a great way of um reducing weeds is using barriers as you can see in the top picture there on the right that's just a tiny piece of cardboard cut and that's just going to fit around the cabbage or lettuce and that that um stops the weeds from coming up underneath it it also breaks down and ends up feeding the ground as well. So I would put that underneath and then put some compost on top of the cardboard. Um, use bark. I was using bark today. Um, leaves, 
any composts, you know, mulch with coconut matting even. But all of these you're having to buy in except for your compost and your leaves, you know, use whatever you can get for free. Um, even straw around the base, you know, if you've got um, rabbits, the old straw that you've got, put it around the base of your tree or your shrubs, sorry, for your, your, um, your vegetables. What you're trying to do there is you're trying to create a barrier to stop the sunlight from germinating the weeds. So if they can't get the sunlight, they won't germinate most of the time. Um, consider a no dig approach to cultivating the soil because underneath the top of the soil, you've got the dormant seeds in there. And as soon as you dig them up, bring them to the surface, they can then get the sunlight. So if you're doing a no dig, or um, I think Jilly mentioned last week, the lasagna way of gardening, you're not um, bringing those seeds up to the surface that's dormant under the ground there. Um, Karen, can I, sorry, can I just put in there um, too? Um, Joan had asked a wee question, what is coconut matting? Right, it's it's just, it's a byproduct from the coconuts. It's the, the you know, the, the fibrous bits from around the coconut. And some companies, they, they cross, sort of wave them together and make a mat. So it's, it's, if you just think of um, a mat, a bit like your, um, your doormat that you wipe your feet on, some of them used to be made from coconut matting, but something thinner, it's a lot thinner and you can put it, you buy them and they can put around your, um, your vegetables. But, you know, if you've got old cardboard, you don't need the coconut matting. Old cardboard is just as good. And it's, it's saving the cardboard going into a landfill site as well. I, I would also use um, grass clippings as, as a mulch and a weed suppressant around my, um, obviously it's time of year when we're starting to cut the grass and stuff too, but I'd be careful not to put it, you know, right up to the edge of the plants because it can be, it can be hot, you know, but, and, um, and also it can be a place for the slugs and stuff to be, but then if you, if you put it deep enough, and it is a wee bit hot, then the slugs don't seem to like to be there either. So again, it's something, if you've got grass to cut and it's free, you might as well. And then it rots down eventually. Yeah, great. And um, another good thing that it does this time of year is it stops the, uh, it warm, keeps them warm as well, stops the, the frost. Well, hopefully you won't be planting them in the frost, but it keeps them a bit warmer and it also keeps the moisture in the ground having that mulch around mm -hmm. right so um another dealing with weeds is hand weed or hoe like jilly said be vigilant you know if you see weeds coming up take them out as soon as you see them really before they get established and got time to throw the roots down there too much so as soon as you see some weeds it's good practice to go out and hoe them off or pick them off Right, that's that's the end of my slides. Oh, so, right. has, any questions on? Thank you. Well, just um, if we're waiting for other people to ask questions. Could um, can I ask? Just you mentioned frost, or Karen, and then we're supposed to be getting frost next week, aren't we? I think. Or yeah, um, I think there's a frost forecast for tonight, from what I was looking at. Okay. As well. So if you have, I mean, you obviously with the food for thought packs, I, d I don't know that anybody would have any seedlings out yet. Sure, they wouldn't. So, you know, if they're in the house, that they'll, they'll be good enough. And actually, the few and far between, I would say, over the next period of weeks. So it's, it's not, um, I mean, if you have something in the ground at the minute, would you be running out and trying to cover it or anything, Kieran? I haven't really, I've, I've got some potatoes in and they're covered well with the soil um, and the onions that they're only just coming up. Um, I do cover my strawberries with fleece, but, you know, people don't have to go out and buy expensive fleece or whatever. You, if you was worried, you could cover them with straw, like we mentioned earlier, but I haven't really got anything out yet. I think it's far too early. I've still got them all on the windowsills, like I said last week. 
Yeah, I'm I'm same as you, Karen. I always I always like to take my time actually to so mm. not put things out too early. Um Joan has asked another question. Um, what's the best way to recycle meat products? Um, as we had said, don't add them to the compost. Well, I suppose that's you, you put those you can put those in your food bin, the council bin, can't you? Yeah. Which will go for, for green waste composting. Um and they can do that because they, they have such a volume and it's turned so often it like it's super heated. Yeah, so, it's it's the same as the you get these bags or coffee cups and nappies that say, you know, compost compostable. Yeah. But in in actual fact, you're not going to break them down in your, your garden um composting heap. They need to go to an industrial composter. They get to the right temperature that we couldn't get to really so don't be fooled by say oh this is compostable i'll put that into the compost heap and no, it's not going to break down sure and um, patricia suggesting the dog <laughs> which is very good suggestion <laughs> recycle meat products if you don't have any um just on the cups and stuff um i kind of i have been adding um eat compostable cups and compostable bags and stuff to my compost heap. Now it is fairly, it's probably wider and, and deeper and everything than a pallet. Um, but because there's there's such a volume, you know, um, it, they do actually break down for us, the cups. And now the lids would take, you'd have to go through them twice really. But we are lazy composters now. We had only, we had only turn ours maybe once you know, in a year and then leave it. So it's that, you know, you get it quicker if you're if you put more effort into it. Um but I have been pleasantly surprised now with the whole the cup thing for us. Um well, they, I think they, they have improved them actually from from when I was doing it before. But yeah, give it a try. I, I've not been successful, but I've only got the small ones, the pallet the pallet ones that you've seen. Sure. Um, also, um, I have I have another question here, um, Karen, on the just on the weeds and stuff. Um, you know, obviously we hear this time of year about you know don't be too quick to cut your grass, and because dandelions are a really important source of nectar for pollinators, you know our first bumblebees and stuff are out. Um, would would you agree with that? You know, it's yeah, yeah raise your cut. Just you, this time of year, if you're cutting the grass, you want to encourage root growth anyway. So you just want to be topping it. You don't want to be cutting your grass as such. And the higher up you've got your, your cut, then you're leaving the dandelions and the buttercups because they're low to the surface growing. So your, your mower blades will go over the top if you keep your cut high. But yeah, you, you just want to be cutting the very tips off the grass because you want you want to encourage root growth rather than green this time of year yeah absolutely um and mulching i think mulching your lawn helps too if you yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah aerate it as well um scarify it get some of the moss out and the, on that last slide there you um you said hand weight or hoe between the plants the hoe is a great is a great thing like that isn't it so before yeah. the before they get established, you know, when you've got all those wee green seedling things coming up, just ruffle the top of the soil or 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 run a hole through it. And a hole is that it's just it's a piece of metal really at the end of a pole, isn't it? That you yeah. goes just under the surface and it just it just cuts off the, the roots of um of new weeds and stuff and and it's great to do it on a warm day actually because then they just shrivel and die and um so it stops them getting ahead of you so has anybody else got any questions now don't be shy put them in the chat box or un unmute yourself and um and ask here and he's very amenable he'll answer most things i don't bite it doesn't bite. <laughs> well, here, tell tell me this. Um, you know, when you go out at night with a torch and stuff, picking off the slugs, what what would you do with yours, Karen? I know you on the bird table. Always the bird table. Yeah, always. 
Are always the bread table. Escaping before the morning, no. Sorry. Are you not afraid of them escaping before? Yeah, the... well, I say I, I do lose some of them, but some of them stay there for the dawn chorus. Right. Okay. Um. I have to say, my my husband Simon goes out. He goes out with a torch and a pair of scissors. So, at least, <laughs> um, I I don't I don't like the um, you know, when you go out, I always have to wear gloves as well because of the slime. Yeah, I find you can't get it off your fingers from the slugs. I know, I know that. And wait, do you know what we forget? Slugs are a gardener's nemesis, but we do forget they're they're really important too in terms of um getting rid of the debris, you know, all the dead yeah. dead leaves and decomposing and decaying stuff. But yeah, if we can just um the barrier stuff, like the coffee grounds and the um, the eggshells and the shark stand sand, that does really help, I think too. Yeah, that, that, there's um you can if you wanted to buy copper as well to put around your plant pots and stuff like that. But even putting your plant pots on sharp sand, you know, that stops them getting to the plant pots in the first place. Yeah, that's right. And keep looking under the pots, as you said, you know, if you're um because that's where they're that's where they hide, just waiting to come out when whenever you're you're sleeping. And like like you said earlier, make it fun. You know, counting how many you can have a competition between your husband and yourself to see who can get the most slugs. You got to make it fun. Gardening should be fun. It should. Doesn't say much for our marriage, Karen. To be fair, <laughs> 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 that's the entertainment of an evening. <laughs> our argument would be, where's the batteries for the torch? <laughs> Indeed. Um, oh. Uh, so Joan is asking the question uh, of you, Karen. Did you ever use a saucer of beer to attract the slugs? Do you know, I, I did try it and I thought, what a way to die. But it's a great way to die, but it's it's not um, it's not friendly on the slugs, but never mind. But it does work. The beer traps do work. I did have one in the, um, in the polytunnel because I couldn't find where they were getting in. So I put a beer trap there and it, they do work, but it's, it's not a humane way of getting rid of them. Not like giving them to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> but it does work. The beer traps does work. But yeah. the only thing is they don't look so nice when you've got to fish them out of the beer trap. No, no. And then you've got to get rid of them from there. Yeah, it's my husband asking these questions, but he's shy. Because he... <laughs> okay. okay. Gets me to do all the dirty work. <laughs> Well, you're here, Joan. As, um, and obviously buy the cheapest beer you can if you're, yeah, if you're going to use it for that, I think. <laughs> well, we, we live in Maville and there's a lovely big tree in Maville and it's a great tree. But they always said that the pub used to get rid of the slops from the beer into the, and it all fed this tree and that's why it's so big and vigorous. Oh, there you go. Very good. So if you've got some old beer that you don't want, feed your plants with it. Absolutely. Now just I just when you're on that, Karen, about feeding your plants, and obviously the, the stronger and healthier your plants are, the more resistant they are to pests and diseases and things. Um, you, my mum uses cold tea to for her house plants and things like that. Is that? Um, would you do that? Yes, my, my mother used to do the same. She always used to leave a little bit in the bottom of the tea. But in them days, they didn't have tea bags. It was always loose tea. So that was one reason. But yeah, she always used to feed the tomatoes with um, her old tea. Yeah. And they, they worked. And, you know, it's no different to putting your tea leaves on your compost heap, really, is it? I oh, know, absolutely. I suppose when you think of it that way, it's right. And um and as you say, the you know, some weeds can be really useful, like the um like your nettles to make your your you know, they're really useful for wildlife, obviously, but to make your your nettle soup or nettle compost or compost tea. Um so it's it's nice to have a wee wild bit of your garden if you can. Chamomile, you can make your tea from your chamomile as well. You know, mm. a chamomile would be classed as a weed. You know, that's it's a, a good weed. And chickweed is edible. Yeah. As is hurry bittercress, actually. Um, 
I think so were dandelions, but they're they wouldn't they're a wee bit better for me now. So we we'll have a question here from Rory about um Rory Moyna, good our good friend from the first Food for Thought project. Um, does the nettle soup keep from year to year or are you better to start again each year? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I missed that question. You froze on me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Karen. It's Does the nettle soup keep from year to year or are you better making fresh stuff? I, I don't know because I've always used it and I've never had enough to keep. I, I feed it every Friday. I go out. That's the Friday ritual. Feed everything with the um, nettle soup. Okay. And then Rory, so that's, um, you need to step up now and start using more, I think. Yeah. Um, he's also asking, can you just spray the nettle soup mix onto seedlings? You maybe um, have seedlings, would you, Karen? Yeah, I can't see a, a reason why, but you're just wasting the, you're wasting it because they're not looking for nutrients, really, the seedlings as such, you know. I'd save it for when, when they are, when you are needing it. Yeah, you when know, once you've potted on your seedlings, they've got the fresh compost and they've got enough um, nutrients in that. So it's, it's, it's just a case of wasting the, your resources, really. Sure. OK, so maybe it's so a wait until you plant them out, really, and then start, really start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Mary, Mary Therese has also said that she made her first nettle soup today. Brilliant. Hooray. Well done. Uh, tip to remember, double glove. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wait till wait till three to four weeks time and you'll be you'll be smelling it from one end of the garden to the other. <laughs> That's great. You might might need to explain that to the neighbours. Just Yeah, I always cover mine. I have a, a bucket with a lid and that helps. Yeah. Sure. Well, look, has, any, has anybody has anybody else got any questions for Cairn or um, do we need to go and have a cup of tea or glass of something stronger? Because it's nearly holiday weekend. <laughs> I have another stupid question. I, I'm, I'm one of those people that asks all the stupid questions. Um, no such so thing. When you're talking earlier, <laughs> when you're talking earlier, Cairn, about compost, how long does it take from when you start to make your compost until you can use it? Or maybe you said it by minutes. Because you said you had three bins. Is it, like, is it like the third year you can use it? Or is it how no, long? Is um, it? After um, 12 months, uh, you can use it. You know, it, you could, it all depends on where you've got it situated and the conditions. You could use it in six months. It all depends. But um, if you used it, if you gave yourself 12 months, then it's going to be good. Um, even, I think we touched on it last week, gathering up the leaves in the autumn and bagging that, you know, add that to your compost as well, or just use the old leaves in a bag, put, put some holes in there. And then after 12 months, you can feed your soil with that. You know, it's a good soil conditioner, the old leaves. But you'll, you'll find that your compost will break down a lot quicker if you break it down. You know, the more you cut it down into smaller pieces, the worms and other microorganisms can work easier and faster. And and do, you have, do you have to cover it or is it okay not having a, like a, a roof, like a roof on it? Or does, is it okay to have it like just open? So I was just thinking about how much rain might get in and whether... Yeah, I, I tend to cover it because of the rainfall where I am. But, you know, if you've got it in a part of your garden where it's not going to get too sodden, then you wouldn't need to cover it. But I do cover mine. You, you don't want too much water because it, you need the oxygen in there and the worms to work. And plus, you don't want all your nutrients leaching out of the bottom with all the rainwater. All right. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Actually, Karen, uh, Mary Therese on the chat has said, if making a pallet compost or what would you cover it with? Um, so it's probably old carpet or... Yeah, um, cardboard as well. Cardboard, carpet, and then the cardboard will break down as well. Yeah. It, 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 I cover mine, and if I find it's too dry, I get, I get some water on it just to 
to dampen it down. Covering it also stops any weed seeds that could blow in onto it, you see. Sure, yeah, okay. So anything at all really that keeps that helps the water to run off and yeah. uh, the weed seeds out. That's a good, good tip. So any more questions at mm -hmm. all? So next, so next Thursday um, will be our fourth and, and last in the series webinar of um, with myself and that will be harvesting kind of what what's the best time in the right way. So you know, the way sometimes you've got herb plants and stuff, you know, people say, oh, I've cut, I've cut my rosemary back mm -hmm. and it looks, you know, it looks like it's dead. And, um, and actually the best way to cut rosemary or thyme or hardy herbs like that is just to give them a really light wee haircut, I think. So um, we'll discuss that. Um, and also um, nature friendly garden, gardening, you know, how, just expand probably on what we did this evening and then answer any more um any more questions that you have so Mary Therese is saying thanks very much um and thank you all very much for for taking the time to tune in um and I hope you'll get out and about or outside or sowing your seeds if you haven't yet and actually there's plenty of time so if you haven't don't um worry about that and as Karen said last week um, you know, little and often. So don't, you know, don't don't feel you have to um, sow all your seeds at once because you absolutely don't. Um, and if you do them every few weeks, you'd have fresh stuff coming along then. So um, thank you very much, Karen. as always. Um, that was You're welcome. It's been really, a pleasure. Really informative. And um, and hopefully we'll see, we'll see most of you next Thursday. It's the fun day next Thursday, isn't it? When you get to harvest your, your, your vegetables. Yeah, it might be. I mean, it might be a bit soon and a bit optimistic, but do you know what? If you get some nice warm weather like that, it's it's amazing how quickly things can grow. You know, I'm just looking at stuff in the garden today and it's, um, you can see them in a week, you know, they've got mm. bigger. So I know it's going to get cold again probably, but um, that's the whole thrill of, of gardening and growing food really i think so it's, it's therapy as well isn't it watching like the yeah. double in size in a week and it you know it's yeah. it's good therapy for you watching them it is it is good therapy and god knows we, we're all having a, a bad enough time at the minute so with one thing and another um so yeah brilliant i yeah get out there as much as you can and thanks very much and we'll see you next week all right good night